All right, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Brianna Larrick, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar titled Science is Self-Correcting, But the Record is Not, Challenges and Opportunities for Journals and Scientists. Today, we aim to highlight challenges that exist when attempts are made to correct the scientific record and identify opportunities for the scientific community to improve on this process. We are a nonprofit scientific organization that advances science related to the nutritional quality and safety of the food supply. We do not lobby, rather, we operate under a tripartite model bringing together scientists from government, academia, and industry to advance science in support of public health. This webinar will consist of a series of short presentations by our invited speakers, followed by a moderated panel discussion. If you have questions or comments for the speakers, please feel free to submit them at any time in the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel. A recording of this presentation will be made available after today's webinar. And with that, it is an honor to introduce our moderator for this webinar, Dr. Johanna Dwyer. Dr. Dwyer is a professor of medicine and community health at the Tufts University Medical School and professor of nutrition at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. For over 25 years, she has served as the editor of the review journal Nutrition Today. She is an engaged member of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and has served for a decade on the Academy's Report Review Committee, the Food and Nutrition Board, several committees, and on the Institute of Medicine's Council. And if that weren't enough, she is also senior scientist at the Jean Meyer USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts University and director of the Francis Stern Nutrition Center at Tufts Medical Center. Johanna has published on issues of scientific integrity and is acutely aware of its importance from her work in academia and government. So thank you for joining us today, Johanna, and I'll hand it over to you to introduce our first speaker. Thanks so much, Brianna. This is great. I think the disclosure that's most relevant today is that I've been a, uh, an editor as well, so we can get started right away with the, um, the various uh, speakers. Um, I'm lucky to have the opportunity to, to be with the, you all here. We'll start off focusing on some challenges existing for journal editors when uh, concerns requiring corrective actions of various sorts are raised and how the current system disincentivizes uh, some of this. Uh, Dr. Uh, first speaker is Dr. Wallace Hayes and Dr. Hayes holds both the PhD and master's degrees from Auburn University and also uh, a baccalaureate from Emory. He's authored more than 320 publications in the peer-reviewed literature, and he's currently um, the author of several books and peer-reviewed journals. He edits um, uh, Human and Experimental Toxicology and Toxicology Research and Application. He's the president of the Toxicologic Forum, and he's also a fellow of the Academy of Toxicological Sciences and the Royal Society of Biology, as well as the American College of Forensic Examiners and the American College of uh, Nutrition. Dr. Hayes was named Distinguished Fellow by the American um, College of Toxicology in 2013, and he's a fellow of uh, the uh, AAAS as well. He's currently an affiliated professor at the University of South Florida's Marsani College of Medicine in Tampa. Welcome, Wally, and uh, why don't you take over the visual platform? I particularly want to thank Yotsi for putting together uh, this session, because I think this is a very, very important area that we need to uh, really delve in and uh, and think about it in, in a very serious way. Just to uh, show any potential conflict, I am the editor for the Americas of Human Experimental Toxicology and the editor-in-chief for Cutaneous and Ocular Toxicology 
and Toxicology Research and Application, which is an open access journal. What I'd like to do is talk just a little bit about the peer review process, uh, spend some time on retractions and corrections, both at the pre-publication and post-publication level, and then close out with some consequences. I don't think anybody would deny who's ever done any reviewing for a scientific journal uh, that reviewing is time consuming uh, and uh, one really needs to be dedicated to undertake a review process. There are all types of articles that need reviewing from original research to clinical, to review articles, to perspectives, opinions, and commentaries, and book reviews. But I think in the end, it boils down to the integrity of the author to report their data as true as they can possibly represent uh, the results that they've obtained. And as a caveat, I don't think any journal, even uh, the sciences and natures and proceedings of the National Academy, uh, have the resources to reproduce the study to confirm or refute the results. So we really, as editors, have to rely on the integrity of the authors to report their data uh, appropriately. Well, the ideal reviewer, I've never found one, uh, but if you are one, uh, please contact me. Uh, and this is someone who's experienced in one or more areas of the paper. Uh, they have the same discipline, but not uh, really deeply involved in exactly the same area, so there's no direct competition. Uh, they are able to acknowledge that there's no conflict of interest, or they can declare what that conflict of interest is, that they're objective, they have good judgment, they're willing to look at the hypothesis, familiar with the models and the methods, they're able to judge the quality of the data and the analysis, and able to take that information and assess the validity of the conclusions and significance, and they can think clearly and logically, and from my standpoint, very importantly, to write a good critique that's accurate, readable, and above all, helpful, uh, not only to the editor, uh, but to the authors, and return it within an allocated period of time. Reviewers are hard to find. I've had to go as many as 15 to 20 to get two to three uh, respectable reviews. Some reviews are not helpful at all, and I just listed a few for you. It can be expected because it is written well and designed. I have reviewed the paper carefully. It can be accepted. Some comments to the authors, dear author, I read this article. The study has some limitations. The sample size is small. Abstract is too complicated, full of abbreviation. And those kind of things really don't help. I guess my favorite is the one I just got recently. The authors created the article within the framework of scientific criteria, and I have no idea what that reviewer meant by this. Uh, other reviewers are helpful and useful uh, to improve the quality and qu uh, uh, quantification of the papers. I don't think there's any doubt that as we look at the number of papers that are being published, uh, Retractions are on the rise, but when you think about it, we're only at about 0.02% uh, retractions, uh, and it's been that level since we've been tracking this. Uh, retractions, as I've said, are on the rise, and we're seeing a lot of this uh, in the COVID-19 era. Uh, the last I saw, about 33 retractions had taken place. Uh, probably the most infamous of these are the Perfect Storm, uh, which is a company uh, that published in Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, suggesting uh, that hydroxychloroquinone uh, just did not work. And they said they had uh, 100,000 patients in 60, uh, 671 hospitals on six continents. And we now know that information uh, is just was not correct. These papers have been withdrawn. Uh, the CEO of the company moved his uh, license, medical license from Illinois to Ohio. I'm not sure why he did that. 
uh, but maybe he was covering his tracks. Very recently, in an Elsevier publication, Science of the Total Environment, uh, the uh, authors at the University of Pittsburgh uh, are requesting to retract their paper uh, relating uh, COVID-19 to magnetism, uh, and that paper is going to be withdrawn. It's not just the types of journals in my area of toxicology, uh, but some of the very best journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, PNAS, Lancet, Nature, Cell, Science, all are involved uh, in the retraction issue. From the standpoint of pre-publication, this is really from an editor's standpoint where we hope uh, we can uh, handle these things. And in the case of Safe Publication, one of my publishers, uh, they have set out this statement, which basically says that the publishers and the journal has the right to take appropriate action. Here's a case of one in which rejection was due to the authors and the reviewers using the same computer. So we were able to find out that the uh, that there was a fraudulent uh, computer uh, involved in this that both the author and the reviewers used, and we disqualified this paper from further consideration. A second example before publication was rejection to dual submissions. Uh, they had sent it to several journals. Uh, one of my reviewers had also reviewed it for another journal, and so we then uh, rejected and returned the paper uh, without going forward with the review process. May not end with publication. Uh, accepted manuscript can be questioned for all kinds of reasons uh, related to data interpretation. Uh, and I just listed a number of these. And uh, you can go to the COPA guidelines. I'll uh, give you their uh, publication site where you can get the guidelines for retraction. This just lists the common reasons uh, that we're seeing uh, retractions, uh, not reproducible. It's really a hard one uh, to look at, although a couple of the larger chemical companies have done this. Bear Health uh, looked at 25 basic studies in cancer uh, and weren't able to reproduce uh, many of these. Uh, a bit later, uh, Amgen uh, looked at uh, six out of 53 landmark uh, studies and they were only able to reproduce uh, six of these and that's 11 percent uh, other reasons i think maybe we're lowering the barriers uh, because of the large number of journals that are out there and the concept of publish and perish and there are just too many journals and particularly the predator journals uh, that are out there uh, that are causing a lot of issues and anybody that is Thinking about submitting a paper needs to be very careful of these predatory journals. I'm going to give you three examples of post publication. Uh, one that I think that everybody's quite familiar with, uh, and this is the Lancet article uh, that uh, caused all kinds of problems with uh, vaccines, measles, mumps, and rubella. Uh, we know that it took 12 years uh, for this to reach a final conclusion, including the fact that. Uh, a number of groups said everything was fine, uh, but in the end, uh, because of the work of uh, a number of other individuals beyond uh, those that thought that it was good work, uh, it turned out uh, that there was a real black mark, and it took 12 years to resolve the issue, uh, and Dr. Wakefield uh, lost his medical license, uh, and uh, the paper was finally retracted. An example in cutaneous and ocular toxicology, the journal was notified uh, and we looked uh, along with the publisher. Uh, the publisher followed up with the authors over a period of several months. Uh, the authors were informed that the paper was going to be withdrawn. And the reason that it was withdrawn uh, is because uh, that uh, it did not follow COPA guidelines. Uh, the retracted article Unfortunately, it's going to remain online to maintain the record, uh, but it will be marked uh, retracted. Uh, this retraction was due to fabrication and plagiarism. Uh, they uh, submitted it to two other places. 
and they took figures from other people's work and used it uh, in their own. Uh, food and chemical toxicology uh, was one that was some years ago uh, having to do with long-term toxicity of a Roundup herbicide. Uh, a number of people uh, wrote in saying that there were issues with this. Uh, the publisher, uh, along with the editor, we went back and we looked at it. Uh, we had a uh, academic statistician and a well-known veterinary pathology review uh, the data, the raw data, and it was concluded that the conclusions reached in the paper were not supported by uh, the data that was supplied, and so the paper uh, was withdrawn. Consequences, nobody wins. The journals are damaged, the authors are damaged, uh, the author's institution uh, is affected, and academic publishing industry also suffers. What happens to retracted papers? Uh, you can go on to retraction database and get more information. Uh, the latest that I could find, unfortunately, was in 1999. Uh, about 8% of uh, citations continue to acknowledge uh, the paper was retracted. The unfortunate is that 92% of those citations never indicate that the paper that they're citing was a retracted paper. And then of 391 citations analyzed, only 6% acknowledged uh, the uh, retraction. So with that, uh, I'll stop and turn it back over to our moderator. Uh, and uh, we can go on to the next uh, presentation. Wow, Wally, thank you. That was great. Uh, well, now we're going to turn to uh, the whole issue of the current system and how it disincentivizes corrections of mistake and the impact that this can have on the public trust in science and the scientific community. Our, our next speaker is Marcia McNutt. Uh, Dr. McNutt holds the doctorate in earth sciences from Scripps and a baccalaureate from Colorado College. She's a geophysicist and the, the 22nd president of the National Academy of Sciences, and I think the first woman president. Uh, prior to that time, she was the editor in chief of the science journals. And so this is particularly wonderful for us to hear from her. She was also director of the U.S. Geological Survey from 2009 up to 2013. And during that time, uh, the, the, uh, she led the effort uh, of USGS to respond to uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill, among other um, bad events. And for that work that um, she did on the containing that spill, she was awarded the Coast Guard's Meritorious Service Model. Well, Marcia is a fellow of the uh, American Geophysical Union and of the Geological Society of America and the American Ins Association of Advancement of Science, of course, and also the International Association of Geodesy, which I discovered is the mathematics of shape and area of the Earth. Marcia, please let us hear your wisdom. I'm so pleased to be part of this panel. What I'd like to uh, briefly go through, if I could have the next slide, is um, how there are problems with the current system and how we could do better. So in this one slide, I am going to briefly summarize all the main points I'm going to cover. So for anyone who falls asleep during my presentation, if you just remember this first slide, you'll get the whole thing. So while retractions are an essential tool for correcting the literature and preventing flawed research from having a deleterious impact on things like the progress of science, the application of science to sound decisions, and trust in science, retraction is unfortunately at best a crude tool. It's got shortcomings such as the stigma of having a paper retracted and the delay, as you just heard in the case of the Wakefield one, 12 years, unacceptable. And so I'm going to advocate that it would be preferable to build self-correction into earlier stages of the research process through increased transparency, emphasis on quality, and built-in checks and replication. So if I could have the next slide, please. 
So first of all, why retract? Well, retractions are important because they remove incorrect, falsified, and other untrustworthy results from the scientific literature. So they do not mislead other researchers who apply science in decisions, and they don't mislead the public. Very important and helpful. Retractions are a key element in the self-correcting nature of science. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, I'm just gonna go quickly through uh, some famous retractions. Uh, all of you probably recall the very famous case of the STAP cells, where uh, a young researcher in Japan um, claimed that uh, she could create pluripotent stem cells by bathing adult cells in a mild acid bath. The scientific method worked perfectly in this case because the work was immediately questioned as too good to be true. The work could not be re replicated and the institution, uh, Riken in this case, investigated and irregularities were indeed found. If I could have the next slide. So what went right in this particular case was that the community quickly uncovered problems in the research, including duplication of images from her thesis in the Nature paper. There was a swift investigation by Riken and a prompt retraction by Nature. But what went wrong, if I could have the next slide, is that um, peer review failed at Nature to question a paper that was too good to be true. No investigation at any other institutions were conducted even though there were co-authors that were also responsible for the oversight of this work. And there were failures of some institutional communications to emphasize that the system actually basically worked in this case, that the, the fraud was found and it was rooted out quickly. And unfortunately, one co-author shown here committed suicide over the stigma of um, this uh, failure. And so that was, um, uh, I think we would all agree, too high a price to pay for a retracted paper. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, we just heard about this uh, probably most famous retracted paper in all history, and this is the Wakefield one. If I could go on to the next slide. Um, we already heard um, sort of what went right, that, um, it actually, though it's true, that peer review of this paper did detect the weaknesses in the original study design and analysis, and peer reviewers recommended that the paper not be accepted. But the editor of The Lancet accepted the paper over the objections of at least one peer reviewer. And it was investigative journalists who uncovered Wakefield's conflict of interest eventually. Wakefield was sanctioned and thoroughly disgraced by the professional community. But if we look at what went wrong on the next slide, the lack of declarations of conflicts of interest for authors uh, were horrendous. Institutions sensational, sensationalized the study results when Wakefield was riding high. Politicians failed to set a good example when the leaders in the UK were asked whether they would get their children vaccinated, they did not go come out and say, yes, they would. As you already heard, um, it took 12 years to be re retracted and Wakefield in the meantime became a folk hero. If I could have the next slide, please. Now here's one that um, I personally handled when I was uh, editor in chief of science. This was a faked study on how to change attitudes on gay marriage. This was the liqueur in green study. Um, the fraud was uncovered primarily because uh, two young researchers, Brookman and um, Kayla at uh, Berkeley were unable to recreate liqueur's sample return rate from uh, his canvassing. So they got suspicious of the results. So if you go to the next slide, what went right in this case was that um, thanks to their work, the community quickly uncovered problems in the research in the process of trying to duplicate the results. Don Green, who was the senior author, immediately asked for a retraction when the student, LaCour, who was at UCLA and Green was at Columbia, failed to produce the original data. 
So the paper was retracted by science within a few months of publication. But on to the next slide. What went wrong here was LaCour refused to agree to the retraction in the face of incontrovertible evidence that he had falsified many statements in the paper beyond just the data. And so in fact, what we had to do was retract it on um, technicalities that he had um, claimed IRB review when he didn't have it. He had um, claimed um, that he had support from certain foundations when he didn't. And uh, actually the paper was downloaded more than 100,000 times before it was retracted just in those few months. Um, fortunately, the two Berkeley uh, students went on to do the study properly and upheld the um, ultimate findings. So it's too bad that LaCour didn't do the study appropriately because his uh, instincts on the uh, right result were actually uh, on target. So if I could have the next slide. Um, so all of these um, led to uh, a very famous economist uh, article about trouble in the lab about um, uh, retractions, about fake studies, about conflicts of interest, et cetera, that led uh, a group of us to write uh, an article in uh, science about how we need to tackle this head on and promote increased transparency and openness in research, to recognize excellence in reviewing and provide more incentives for putting e effort into reviews, create at least two classifications of retractions and distinguish honest mistakes from fraud so that um, there's actually an incentive for um, removing uh, papers that just have an honest mistake and improve language in conflict of interest declarations. Um, perhaps use terms such as declaring relevant relationships rather than conflict of interest because relevant relationships is a more neutral term. If I could have the next slide. At the National Academy, um, we wrote um, an important report on fostering integrity in research, um, which uh, recommended, among other things, for the creation of a research integrity advisory board to become an organizational focus for best standards and practices. And in response to that, the National Academy of Sciences is standing up a Strategic Council for Research, Ethics, Integrity, and Trust, otherwise known as SCORIT. And it will be charged with identifying and anticipating, anticipating and prioritizing key challenges to research ethics, integrity, and trustworthiness across all sectors. So it's not to duplicate what publishers are already doing or what um, funding agencies like NSF or and NIH are doing, but it is going to try to work across the various stakeholders to align their incentives so that they all work in concert to raise the excellence of the entire enterprise. And this will be a venue for stakers, stakeholders to advance collectively the integrity, ethics, resilience, and effectiveness of the research enterprise. So the end game of this would be self-correction by design, by adopting an enterprise-wide approach to self-correction built into the design of science. Um, we can educate students to perform and document responsible research, share information that is well-documented openly, validate work in improved ways, um, beyond reproducibility to generalization and independent verification using alternative methods, uh, create tools to make self-correction easy and natural, and fundamentally shift the culture of science to honor rigor rather than uh, sensationalism. So that's it, and thanks very much. Look forward to the discussion. Marcia, thank you. That was just terrific. Um, Let's go on now and, and think about what kinds of types of errors warrant a, re, a correction and what the challenges are for scientists who need to make a retraction or a correction in the peer-reviewed literature and, and finally how it can be done better. And we'll come back to a lot of this. Uh, by the way, if you have a question, put it into the 
question box so we can get your uh, get your questions. I'm going to now introduce Dave Allison. Dr. Allison's dean and distinguished and also the proudest professor at the Indiana University's uh, Bloomington School of uh, Public Health. And before that, he was a distinguished professor, the Kate Lay uh, Endowed Professor and Director of the uh, Nutrition uh, NIH sponsored uh, Nutrition Obesity Research Center at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He has over 600 scientific publications. He's done research all the way from model organisms up to uh, epidemiology, and he's received many awards. In 2020, he received the uh, Pfizer Award from the American Society for Nutrition and the Don Owen Award of the American Statistical Association. In 2012, he was an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine of the uh, National Academies, and he's known as a staunch advocate for rigor and for truthful communication of research findings. David? Thank you, Johanna. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with everybody. It's um, especially an honor and a difficult challenge to follow Marsha McNutt, the president of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, but uh, I enjoy learning from uh, everybody so far. And let's get into this. So uh, you can see that the title of my talk is Science is Self-Correcting Only While Kicking and Screaming. And I think that reflects my experience of spending a great deal of time correcting the scientific literature or trying to, sometimes being successful, but often having to wrangle along the way. I'm not going to read this slide to you. It has my disclosures and acknowledgments, um, but you can see at the bottom my email address. My slides are available upon request, and so I'll be delighted to send them to anyone who drops me an email. Next slide, please. And here's an outline we're going to talk about, the need for knowledge and truth, uh, what are challenges to self-correcting literature, and what do we do going forward? Next slide. And why would he, do we need this? You know, I, I sometimes get questions from people, particularly in applied areas like public health and um, some aspects of nutrition and obesity research that sort of almost seem anti-science coming from academics. So why, why are you making such a fuss about rigor? Do we really need to know that? Do we really not need to know that eating that is bad and eating this is good? And, and I think the answer is yes, we really do need to know because conjecturing is good, but knowing is better. And here's just a simple example. I could give you hundreds like this of studies in which we thought we knew something. And the study shows us that in fact, not only did we not know it, but maybe the opposite was true. We only know that if we as John Hunter famously said to Edward Jenner several hundred years ago when the vaccine was born, do the experiment. So my friend Gary uh, Foster did an experiment. This was a cluster randomized trial of the effect of a particular breakfast plan in the classroom on obesity in urban school children. And you can see the setup here. Can we click again? And here's the primary outcome. So there was no significant difference between intervention and control schools on um, combined instance of overweight and obesity. But in the secondary analysis, there was a statistically higher rate in the intervention schools than in the control schools of the prevalence of obesity. So what seemed to happen is that when you combined existing obesity and new obesity, you actually got more obesity as a result, and I use the word result pointedly because we have a randomized controlled trial, of putting in this program for breakfast consumption. Now, that may or may not be important to you. You may have many questions about whether this is really about breakfast consumption or a breakfast program. Those are all good questions. But the point is that this is not something that was anticipated and that uh, it shows one of the many, many times in which we not only cannot predict the result, but sometimes the result is the opposite of what we expect and harmful. And so instead of spending our money on something that intuitively felt good, we now know that this thing has problems. Next slide, please. This is why we put out a book. This book, It's About Knowing, is from my school, 
which we talk about public health as an academic discipline and the importance of rigorous science in knowing. Next slide, please. And by the way, if anybody wants the book, just drop me an email, we'll send you a free copy. So Johanna presaged that I would talk about how do things go wrong? And there are many ways in which science can go wrong. One way is just um, plain old fashioned fraud. And we often hear about how bad things are today, how much worse they are today than the good old days. And I'm not sure that the good old days were always so good. And um, if you go back in time, some of our greatest scientific heroes engaged in activities that today we would be concerned about. Um, they go back to Gregor Mendel, who almost certainly committed what we would today take to be unequivocally fraud. Um, you know, Dr. McNutt talked about results from stem cells, a uh, stem cell researcher that were too good to be true. That's exactly the case with Brother Mendel's work. Um, that doesn't mean he didn't get the right answer. He got the right answer okay. But he, in fact, came up with the second law of genetics, which is uh, the law of independent segregation, because he looked at separate chromosomes, genes on separate chromosomes, and therefore they were unlinked, right? Linked genes would not segregate independently, and it would violate the second law. But he looked at seven different chromosomes in the pea plant, and the likelihood of randomly picking genes and getting seven from them from seven different chromosomes is effectively zero. His Punnett squares are too close to the expected frequencies. And all of this was pointed out by the great Sir Ronald Fisher. Pasteur probably engaged in what today we would call publication bias. He didn't make up data, but he didn't always put out all the data. Eddington engaged in a more mild form of publication bias in that he was open about it. He eliminated certain data from his um, eclipse measurements, which verified Einstein's theory of relativity that light would bend toward the sun. But he only got Einstein's numbers correctly because he eliminated some sloppy data. It was probably right to do so, and he openly did so. But today we might say, well, did you bend it too much to get the answer you knew was true? A reporter once asked Einstein, after this, how would you have felt if Lord Eddington had not confirmed your result with his experiment? And Einstein replied, I would have felt very bad for the good Lord because it would have meant the experiment was wrong. So great confidence in the result led to a willingness to, to throw out some of the data, to have the data confirm the result. We have Rene Blanlon who purportedly discovered NRAs. You may not have heard of NRAs, that's because NRAs don't exist. And there's every reason just honest error. The great Linus Pauling published in PNAS a triple helix model of DNA. So we all know DNA is a double helix, but Pauling had bad x-ray crystallography data and he thought it was a triple helix. And by the way, it shows the importance of keeping politics out of science. The reason he had bad x-ray crystallography data is because he was very anti-war and the government had taken away his passport and he couldn't travel to Europe and go see Rosalind Franklin's good X-ray crystallography data. And had he done it, we probably would have had the Americans beat the Brits on discovering the double helical structure of uh, DNA, even though James Watts, Jim Watson was an American from IU, in, in fact. In any case, that was a mistake. That mistake from Pauling is published in PNAS. The paper exists to this day and has not been retracted. And we'll get into that. Should that be retracted? I think the answer is no. Let's talk, we'll talk in a little while about why. There are plain old fashioned substandard methods. There's a very famous paper about children um, with apparently too large thymuses having their thymus glands irradiated, which is near the thyroid and therefore caused thyroid cancer and killed some kids who in fact had perfectly normal thymus glands because uh, thymus glands were estimated originally the norms from cadavers, which tended to be malnourished um, poor children who had um, lower than average thymus glands, leading to bad norms. So that's just bad science. It should have been known as bad science even back when it was done. People knew how to sample back then, and that was just sloppy and it led to deaths. And then we have just plain old fashioned weak science. And so for example, what do you do with all the large number of studies where they accurately report what they did, except what they did was kind of weak 
chunky, sloppy science. And that may relate to that GMO paper that our first speaker discussed and that was retracted. Were the data fraudulent? I don't think so, not, it's not my understanding, but it was weak science. It was weak science that was known to be weak when it was published. Should that have been retracted? Let's go to the next slide. So science is self-correcting, right? Merton's norms would suggest it should be. I refer you to Merton's famous paper and work on this, but is it? Next slide, please. John Ioannidis, I've indicated that it's not as a result of many of these biases, right? Science is not a magical process. It's not as if you throw a scientific paper on the table, it somehow corrects itself. It's only self-correcting if the community of scientists correct it. And scientists are people. And we have all the same flaws all other people have. So we've got to buttress our flaws with circumstances that help us overcome them. Next slide, please. We need to cultivate the scientific attitude. And this is a great paper on it, uh, a great book on it by Lee McIntyre that I refer you to. It's a fun read. We need to cultivate the scientific attitude, which is an attitude in which what really distinguishes science from non-science is not the old Popperian attitude ideas that have largely, I think, been abandoned, but is simply an openness to data and evidence and a willingness to change one's views in the face of systematic data and evidence. Next slide, please. Correcting errors is important, as Alexander Hamilton pointed out several hundred years ago. I won't read this quotation, but I hope you enjoy it. Next clip. And we found the hard way that this is not always the case. I started writing letters to the editor five or so years ago and um, started having these amazing experiences where some things got retracted, some didn't, some people admitted mistakes, some wouldn't, some people, uh, the kinds of mistakes we saw were extraordinary, some editors ignored us, some editors wanted to charge us fees for pointing out errors in their in their journals and nature got wind of this and asked us to write about it and so we did and there's a reference to our paper which has now i think become a very important paper in terms of uh bringing people's attention to the idea of how resistant editors and uh, publishers and authors are to correcting clear errors next slide please so what are the challenges to self-correcting next slide please well, um, sometimes the challenges are just not thinking clearly. One of the things that I think can help a lot is just some good, clear mathematical thinking. It's a wonderful book by Jordan Ellenberg called How Not to Be Wrong. Again, it's a good, fun read. I encourage you to read it. And we use that kind of concept of just simple math to find things that don't make sense very often. And here's one example we did it. Some people published a paper on a technique called meridian massage that led to approximately almost 10% weight loss in eight weeks. Now, if any of you have ever tried to lose weight, and I bet many of you have, uh, like me, you've probably found that losing 10% of your body weight in eight weeks is no small and easy thing. So to lose it by getting massage, wow, that sounds great. Back to Marsha McNutt's thought, too good to be true? So I looked at this and I said, sounds too good to be true. The authors had put in the paper, their BMIs at baseline, and their weights at baseline, and their BMIs at the endpoint, and their weights at the endpoint. So now I could say, wait a minute, BMI is weight divided by the square of height. If I know weight at both points and height at both points, I can solve, and BMI at both points, I could solve for height. Now the mathematically astute among you are saying, but wait a minute, wait a minute, you probably the means, not the individual data, and the ratio of means is not the mean of ratios. So you can't quite do that, David Allison, and you'd be right. But if I use geometric means and a little statistical approximations, which I won't get into now, I can do it. So we did it and we were able to show mathematically that in order for these data to be true, the average adult in this study would have had to grow in height 6.5 centimeters over eight weeks. That seems implausible. Most adults don't grow 6.5 centimeters in height. In eight weeks for an entire sample to do so would be extraordinary to say the least we pointed this out to the journal that led to a correction in the paper 
But the authors never explained the nature of the correction. All we, they said is, oh, you're right. The weight loss was only about half of what we reported. Never explained exactly how did that happen. Next slide, please. This is another one that shows resistance to admitting mistakes and corrections. This paper, on the, uh, this paper by Shear et al. called a multi-component school-based intervention shaping healthy choices program came out in a journal called Nutrition, Education, Behavior. Came out with two press releases, including an audio podcast in which the authors being interviewed by the editor of the journal talked about how wonderful their results of gardening were. Gardening was gonna reduce weight loss, uh, reduce weight in school children. And they were going to now roll this out in more schools in California. Presumably someone was going to pay for that rollout in schools in California. So I was intrigued by this. How would gardening make children lose weight? Again, a little too good to be true. I mean, are they? is it that they're eating so many more fruits and vegetables from gardening that it makes them lose weight? Fruits and vegetables have calories, and we know that just giving those to people don't make people lose weight. Is it that the energy expenditure of gardening would make them lose weight? It's a lot of energy expenditure from gardening. So we looked at this. Well, first of all, it wasn't a program about gardening. It was a program that included gardening. You couldn't separate the gardening effect. But more so, the analysis was completely and totally incorrect. It was not only completely and totally incorrect, but it was incorrect in a way that contradicted the author's original statement of how they would analyze the data in their protocol paper. So we pointed this out, a team of statisticians who had expertise and had published an analysis of cluster randomized trial, pointed out to the journal that the analyses left no degrees of freedom. They could not possibly be correct. These are completely invalid analyses. The authors responded and they wrote back, as you can see in the quotation on the right, although we appreciate their expertise, meaning referring to us, we respectfully submit that they, Allison and colleagues, may not be fully familiar with the challenges of designing and implementing community nutrition education interventions in kindergarten through the sixth grade, which is undoubtedly true. I'm sure we're not fully familiar with that. And what in heaven's name has that got to do with the fact that the statistical analysis is incorrect? And these authors refused to correct it. The editor refused to issue a correction. When I asked the editor, have you sent this to a PhD level biostatistician who is independent of the original authors and has expertise in the analysis of cluster randomized trials. Her response to me was, Dr. Allison, I have sent it to who I need to send it to. Seems like people just don't want to accept that something's wrong and say, you know, I made a mistake. And we just fix it. Dig in. Next slide, please. We have another one. Here was another cluster randomized trial. You're starting to see a theme about cluster randomized trials here. Um, a paper was retracted in obesity, also a gardening intervention, also had the wrong analysis. The journal did the right thing, retracted the paper. The authors then picked up the paper, sent it to a new journal, Pediatric Obesity, which you see in the lower right-hand corner, published it. When Retraction Watch contacted the editor of Pediatric Obesity and said, this is odd, why would you publish a paper? that was retracted from another journal. The editor said, I didn't know it was retracted from the other journal, which was okay, fair enough, and then did nothing. Next slide. Here's one where the author, the editor did something, but not fully. This was written up in Retraction Watch on, you can see the article on the left. Uh, a set of authors published a paper in Obesity Facts, uh, making an assertion and that controlling for baseline pre-randomization covariates in randomized controlled trials leads to bias. And we said, no, that's not true. And we then um, demonstrated that in a letter to the editor and said, this is just factually incorrect. You know, from first principles of statistics, we can prove this. And the editor sent our letter and the original paper to a third statistician who said, the letter writers are correct. The original paper is wrong. It's factually incorrect. The editor then went back to the original author, said we think we should retract the paper. The original author said we don't want our paper retracted. And the editor failed to retract the paper. Now, to his credit, he then published an editorial laying all this information out. So it's all there for the reader, but failed to exercise his authority to simply remove factually incorrect 
conclusions from a paper from the literature. Next slide, please. This is a really interesting one. Reminds me of Britney Spears, oops, I did it again. There was a paper that I recently pulled up, uh, the one on the bottom, 2020, and I sent it to one of my postdocs, and this was on intervention effects of a kindergarten-based health promoting program, and so on. It was actually the papers in 2019, our letter came out in 2020. And we pointed out that, again, the cluster randomized trial was an analyzed incorrectly. And as my postdoc was about to send our letter off, he said, you know, David, I did some digging. And he said, I found you wrote a letter to the editor in response to another paper in 2015. And that was in response to the same author group. And when you wrote that and you said they got the analysis wrong and it's the same analytic issue, they wrote back and said you were right. And they admitted that their analysis was incorrect. And now five years later, they're doing the exact same thing and publishing it. And one of my co-authors said, the first time is a mistake, the second time is a decision. So again, a resistance here. Next slide, please. So we see a series of problems in which people, especially authors, don't want to admit a mistake or withdraw a paper. And here we see more on cluster randomized trials coming on. This was uh, another one. We just got one corrected. Um, and what was very interesting is this most recent one we got corrected, number two on the bottom, uh, from childhood obesity. Again, a paper was retracted because we pointed out that the analysis of the cluster randomized trial was incorrect. It took many, many months and many letters back and forth. In this case, the authors took it very seriously. They sent us their raw data. They allowed us to reanalyze them. We showed that their analyses were incorrect. But they kept claiming that there were correct analyses that would prove their point. And the editor was stuck because the editor is not a statistician. And he was having difficulty deciding, are these guys in Indiana right? Or are these original authors right? Eventually, what actually brought the paper down is that we found some inconsistencies in the data. And then the editor just said, well, there are inconsistencies in the data themselves. So we're retracting the paper. We'll give the authors a chance to clean it up and publish a new paper later. The author, the editor was able to not have to ultimately wrangle with what I think is a fundamental problem that editors are wrangling with. And it is what I would call the demarcation problem. The original language of demarcation problem is from Popper, demarcating between science and non-science or science and pseudoscience. We're talking about demarcating the difference between minor mistakes or differences of opinion or weak science and good science on the one end, and on the other end, frank major error that merits a correction. And unfortunately, the editors, even when they're well-meaning, are often not well-equipped, especially in statistics and mathematics and computers and modeling to make those distinctions. We think getting editors some help, we're not sure exactly how to do it, but some help on making this demarcation decision will allow them to say, this is a difference of opinion that merits being ruled out in the letters to the editor. This is a frank error that changes the interpretation results, which merits correction or attraction. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, there we go. Whoops. Can we go back one? So this is some concern about weaponization of retraction, and it goes to that demarcation problem. When somebody demands a retraction, is it a retraction because the original paper is fundamentally flawed and unreliable, or because someone just doesn't like it, or it's weak science? And here's a bunch of things about that now. And I think this is a big concern. There was a movement to try to get our paper on red meat retracted before it was even published, as you see on the left. There was a movement to try to get Nina Tikaltz's commentary retracted over on the right. I think those were wrongheaded. I think those were political. It was people who didn't like the paper and were weaponizing retractions to get their viewpoint across. 
there, I think, you know, the, uh, the First Amendment kind of ideas that the best answer to bad speech is more speech. If you don't like what somebody says, you don't like their opinion, you don't like their reasoning, come out with your opinion and reasoning. That's different than saying there's something grossly wrong with the science itself. Next slide, please. What do we do going forward? Next slide, please. Well, I think we need to distinguish between these different kinds of errors. My thought is relatively minor errors that do not radically alter paper's conclusions. It's a rounding mistake, a calculation mistake, a typographical error. Um, one bit of data was misread, but overall the story is more or less the same. My feeling is it needs to be corrected. I've had those mistakes in my papers. It's embarrassing, it's awkward. Fix them, move on, no big deal. Put out an errata or a car agenda. Major errors that radically alter the paper that any well-trained or informed scientist working in the area should have been aware of merit retraction. That could either be a plain retraction or retract and replace. Right? If it's an honest error, person really screwed up the data. We've seen this. You know, someone loads the entire incorrect data set, analyzes it, and publishes a paper. It's happened. Or misaligns the data. For people who use Excel, this happens all too often. Please don't use Excel as your primary data management tool. Um, those, I think, if the paper was worthy of being published, had the analysis been done right, then fix the analysis, retract and replace the paper. Still a retraction, but there's no ethical stigma. Major errors that radically alter the conclusions but are new enough to have sufficient disagreement in the field to not be commonly known as errors, I think those rec merit commentaries, like the one I gave you an example over on the right. And I think that is the, um, that's the famous Linus Pauling paper, the triple helix. I don't think it should be retracted because I think Pauling was working at the leading edge. I think part of the scientific discovery process at that point was making that mistake. And I think the mistake needs to be pointed out um, there should be commentary about it, shouldn't be hidden, but I don't think it needs to be retracted. Next slide, please. I think we need to do this civilly and politely so that we criticize the science and not the person. We need to publicly comment on differences in interpretation and research, but we need to hold our public comments that may impugn someone's reputation until all the facts are in. You've heard me say some tough things about some papers today. I've tried to avoid saying things about the character of individuals. It's possible that my comments about their papers or what they've done may suggest conclusions to you about them, but I've only done that after the facts are in. Before, before the facts are in, we go to the person, we go to the journal, we don't go publicly. I don't. Other people don't always agree with that. They wanna go right to pub peer and Twitter, and that's their first amendment right. But I think the more we are aggressive, the more we impugn people's reputation before all the facts are in, the less we will be able to have a civil reasoned dialogue about this and destigmatize honest errors and therefore get people to be willing to admit and correct honest errors. Next slide, please. I'm not going to go through all this, but there's a wonderful book, which I disclosed to you that I'm a, a part of the panel that generated this book. So forgive my hubris in saying it's a wonderful book, but it's a wonderful book. And I hope that you will take a look at it. This comes from the National Academy of Sciences or NASM on reproducibility and replicability in science. It has many good suggestions here. Next slide, please. Um, here's a, uh, an editorial we published really saying that at some point, much of what we need is editorial courage. I think editors are the key linchpins here. And I think editors, need to, in some cases, quite frankly, find their spines and remember that there is no substitute for conscience. You need to stand up and do the right thing. Next slide, please. Um, we need to develop new norms in science. We need to develop rigor indices so that we can reward people for rigorous science. I don't think we ever wanna stop rewarding people for exciting science. The so-called perverse incentive problems where we say we reward people for exciting science and statistically significant results and big science and breakthroughs creates incentives to game the system. Well, it does. Well, I don't think we should stop those incentives any more 
then we should stop rewarding the fastest runners for crossing the finish line of the running race quickly. But we also put in checks for misuse of sub, uh, performance enhancing substances, and we also give rewards for good sportsmanship. And I think we need to do the same thing in science. We need countermeasure rewards, not to take away the rewards for good, exciting findings. Next slide, please. So let us take this path through the woods. These are some of our woods at Indiana University in Bloomington. My provost is fond of saying that we have the most beautiful campus in the world. I don't know if that's true, but I like to believe it, and I think she's right. These are some of our woods, and I hope you'll come and visit us. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. That was really very, uh, very interesting and a good uh, uh, wind up. Now we're going to go to some questions and a couple have already come in. Um, one is from a dear friend who I know is an editor of a journal. And uh, what he asks is, how do you believe journals should respond to a publication that has referenced a retracted paper before it was retracted. Wally and Marsha, can I get you to take on that one for a moment? Well, it would seem to me that they don't have any choice if they don't know it is going to be retracted and it's before it's retracted. Uh, they're just kind of stuck in, uh, with knowing what they know. So the way we've handled this uh, at Science is we publish editorial expressions of concern for papers that are under review because there are irregularities that have been identified. It is not a paper that has yet been retracted, but we want to alert the community that there may be some concern. So it's sort of a flashing caution sign that is put on the paper. And we've used that very successfully with a number of papers um, that were ultimately retracted. Great, good ideas. Marcia, this one's for you as well. And by the way, please put your questions into the uh, question box, others who have questions on the, uh, on the line. So Marcia. So before you go to that question, can, can I just respond? You know, science and uh, nature are huge journals with large staffs. The issue really is the small journal where there's a single editor and he has no staff. So I would say that we um, handle that same issue because we don't have that capability uh, to do that. So it's not as though science does any investigations either. Those are, of course, uh, completely uh, sent off to the university where the research was done. So um, it is merely because we've uh, received a message from Retraction Watch, or we uh, received something from the provost at a university saying that an investigation has been launched. Okay. So um, I agree with you, Wally. We, we don't have the resources at science either. Um, I, I would say we've also used um, editorial expressions of concern in cases where a paper never is retracted, but um, one case that I remember it being used was an author wrote us later and said, um, numerous people have uh, contacted me wanting to get the data for this paper and um, the hard drive that it was on was lost and so the data is lost, you know, sort of the equivalent of the dog ate my homework. And, and so we publish an editorial expression of concern about that paper because it, it no longer complies with science's requirements for accessibility to the underlying evidence. Thanks, Marcia. That helps a lot. Um, this is also for you. Um, you mentioned distinguishing different types of retraction so that we could distinguish between an honest error and something that's not an honest error. Um, the, the questioner says, even COPE, that's the Council on Publication Ethics that uh, I think uh, several of you mentioned, now acknowledges that fault should not be a deciding factor for editors 
in determining whether or not a retraction should occur. Because Cope apparently says now, yes. the purpose of which is to correct the literature. So uh, the questioner says, I'm concerned about how we might try to distinguish between two types and who'd be in charge right. of the determination. Yeah, so, um, so I've seen all sorts of different um, methodologies put forward for this. And um, it's, it's indeed true that if you try to uh, distinguish fault, and uh, let's say you have a, a paper with 30 authors, and you're trying to say which of these 30 authors is responsible for it, then you can get into a blame game that never ends. And so I think Cope is right saying, no, let's just determine whether the paper is flawed and needs to be removed. And then um, there's that. Uh, I think the argument I was trying to make is um, I'm talking about a phone call I got from a researcher in Japan who tearfully said to me, my postdoc just came to me and was so apologetic, recognizing that he had used the wrong calibration constants in all of the satellite data that we used in our paper that was published last week in Science. We know that now all of our interpretations have to be redone. Everything is wrong. We have to remove that paper. And so in a case like that, I would prefer to say, this paper has been removed by request by the authors, rather than say it's a retraction, because that was a clear case where there was no investigation, there was no third party, it was simply removed by request of the authors. Good, like that. David, do you have a comment on that one? You like that idea? I was just gonna you say, know, we do the same thing with our journals. If, if if someone would comes to us and says, you know, we have made a mistake, we would like to withdraw the paper. And we just quietly withdraw it, particularly if it hasn't already been published. It becomes a little more difficult when it's been published. Well, if it hasn't been published, I, I think there's nothing to withdraw. If it's been published, I do think it's important that there be transparency. I don't think it's okay to say this paper vanished and no one knows why. I think people need to know what happened. However, I think the reason we have judges in the world is because judgment is important. And there needs to be a way to say, this one we're pulling because it's fraudulent. This one we're pulling because the authors did the right thing. This one we're pulling because we're not sure why. We need to be able to let people pull it and then say, reanalyze it, fix it, and put a fresh version in the so-called retract and replace. The words I'm not so hung up on, I think if we want to call some withdrawn, some remove, some retract, find the words that make everybody feel good. I'm okay with that as long as it's clear and we have these different kinds of options available. Thanks, Dave. The other thing we have to avoid is papers just disappearing. We had a case at Science where um, an author took a science paper and uh, an American Chemical Society paper, took half from one paper, half from the other paper, and published it in a third journal. And uh, you know, it came to our attention through some plagiarism check that this had happened. So science wrote to this third journal and said, by the way, you've published a plagiarized paper from science and ACS. You need to retract this paper. So we checked back a little later. And what they had done was they simply excised it from their website so that there was like this um, gap in the journal. And we wrote them and they said, we said you didn't retract it. And they said, "Oh well, we just we just took it out." And of course, there were still copies of that paper all over, floating around. And we said, "You can't do that. You have to actually retract it so that there's a clear sign that that is not the right thing to do." 
<laughs> oh, that's wonderful. It's like some resumes I've seen where there's this gap of 10 years while the person was in club fed or something. Well, <laughs> Wally, the next one's for you. And it's, um, in your opinion, what went wrong and what went right on this in the Seralini case? And you need to tell us the Seralini case again. And also um, for you is uh, how should papers be reviewed in order to minimize the need for retractions and corrections later? Let, let me let me take the uh, Seralini paper first. And that was the paper from Food and Chemical Toxicology uh, that was entitled uh, Long-Term Toxicity of a Roundup Herbicide and a Roundup tolerant genetically modified maize. Uh, the retraction information was published in Food and Chemical Toxicology uh, in 2014, issue 63. Basically what happened in that paper was about 200 to 300 letters to the editor came in on both sides of the issue. We went back and looked at the original reviews, which were not helpful at all, and leaned it, if anything, towards not accepting the paper. Nonetheless, the associate editor accepted it. Uh, we began to uh, reevaluate it. We got all of the raw data from uh, uh, the laboratory. A statistician reviewed that data uh, and concluded that the wrong statistics had been used. And the pathologist, uh, veterinary uh, board certified pathologist, reviewed all the pathology and concluded uh, that the conclusions uh, that were reached based on the pathology were incorrect. And as a result of that, uh, uh, we interacted with the authors. Uh, uh, requested that they withdraw the paper. They decided not to. It was retracted. Uh, they turned around and published it in another journal, uh, understanding uh, without any review whatsoever. So that's that paper. Uh, I don't think anybody in the end ever wins with a retraction with the exception of maybe science uh, does win in the end. What was the other question? Can you repeat it? Uh, yes, it was just uh, how do we, um, how, it's just uh, the question was how should papers be reviewed? So okay, that yeah, that's a great question. It's one that I thought a lot about and one that I don't know anybody that's doing it. We teach people how to do research. We uh, encourage them to reproduce their work. Uh, we encourage them to validate their methods. We do everything on the front end of the publication. But, but to my knowledge, there are no seminars, no programs out there uh, that help young people, uh, new investigators, graduate students, postdocs. How do you evaluate a uh, paper? And I think, you know, we've got to really remind ourselves that. Uh, People have never, to my knowledge, been trained in reviewing of papers. The journalists probably have, uh, but not the scientists. And so I would think that that's a way to start. Secondly, from my standpoint, uh, the way I would recommend that people review a paper uh, is look at the figures, look at the tables, draw your own conclusions, and now that we are getting so much supplementary data, uh, not to forget that supplementary data. And let me just give you an example of a, a recent paper uh, in which the uh, authors uh, had good analytical methodology, but they had one table in which they looked at various types of plastics uh, in uh, a variety of aquatic organisms, uh, clams shrimp, shellfish, and sardines. And the plastic levels were extremely low in all of the uh, aquatic species with the exception of sardines. And there was about, uh, according to the figure, 
uh, three uh, milligram per gram elevation uh, in uh, the sardines. Apparently, the reviewers did not look at the supplemental data because when you look at the supplemental data of the 10 sardines, only one of them had any plastic in it and it was extremely high. And they divided that one by 10 and came up with their number, uh, which probably is not the way to do it. In addition, uh, that's not a particularly good way to translate your data. The other was, if you look at the, the supplementary data, it was not on one gram of uh, organism, but on 10 grams. So they translated 10 grams to one gram, but also used only uh, one, you know, they divided that one fish by 10. So I think, you know, people have to look at the data, evaluate the data, and then make their conclusions. And as I showed you uh, in my talk, so many people simply just say, I looked at it and it's okay. It's difficult to get good reviews. And so I would just plead with everybody that's out there, think about being a reviewer and giving us good in-depth reviews that help the authors and they help the journals. Thank you, Wally. Did you have something to say on that, David? Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, offer the opinion that I think we expect too much from peer review, at least as it's currently conceived. I think the idea that we need to find better reviewers or train better reviewers, I think is a dead end. I don't think it's gonna get us very far. I think peer review is not a system that's well calibrated, and I'm not sure that was really intended to pick up fraud, to check every mistake. I think to say that peer review doesn't work because of some of these problems that occur, where were the peer reviewers, why weren't they trained, would be like saying restaurant reviews are not worth reading because most restaurant reviewers can't detect salmonella, listeria, and poison in the food. They're not meant for that. They're meant to detect the culinary aspects. And I think similarly, we should not expect peer reviewers to be fraud detectors. They're, they assume that the paper's reasonable or, or not fraudulent, truthful, and then work from there. We may need other systems to detect fraud uh, and correct fraud and other systems to correct profound error. That's not what we should expect our peer reviewers to do. Great, thank you. There's one last question, then we're gonna go to a round. Oh, go ahead, Martha, uh, Marcia. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to add to this, um, I agree with David about um, the appropriate use of peer reviewers is not to detect fraud. But I do agree with um, Dr. Hayes that I think there is a huge issue about the overburdening of the peer reviewers and the difficulty in finding peer reviewers. We had a meeting at Science where um, people from American Chemical Society and AGU which publish a lot of journals, but they also can um, connect their member base to their reviewer base. And what they found was actually interesting was that the authors to their journals are truly international, coming from everywhere. But the reviewers that the journals were pulling from were largely Northern Europe and North American white males so that basically a small subsection of the community is being tasked with doing the quality control for the entire globe. And so until we actually uh, broaden the pool of peer reviewers and trust their, um, what, what they're telling us, um, we're going to have this problem of overburdened peer reviewers. Good point, good point. Thank you. Uh, that alarm that went off was to tell me that we have to uh, we have to get to the last two questions, which are around Robin. And I think what I'm going to do, because we've only got 10 minutes left, is to uh, go to each of you with two aspects to the question. The question is, what do we see, what do you see as the most impactful thing, first of all, that scientists can do? And secondly, 
journals and journal editors can do to improve the corrections process. So why don't we start with Marsha and then David and then Wally. Okay, so um, for scientists, I think they need to um, model uh, the highest ethics, um, model exactly those kinds of uh, uh, issues of integrity, honesty, um, care to attention uh, to their students and to their colleagues. They have to walk the walk, they have to talk the talk. Um, when they have trainees um, show them the correct path. Um, they have to expose their own work to criticism and to critical review. They have to take review um, gently and uh, in the intent that it is. They have to show that they are controlling for their own biases. So I think that's what they have to do. I think um, what journals have to do is exactly what David talked about. They have to hire editors who will stand up to, um, to make tough decisions. Because when journals will not make tough decisions, then, um, then really all is lost and we're gonna have polluted literature. Thank you so much. David? I think for scientists, they need to, um, we need to go back to our roots, both as individuals and as trainers of the next generation. Uh, and standard setters of science to have an uncompromising commitment to truth. This is um, something that may seem obvious, but is apparent not true, uh, not always there. I think we need to get people to say, no, your primary goal as a scientist is not to tell people what they should eat or how they should or shouldn't do this public health practice or to advocate for it. You can advocate. But as a scientist, your primary commitment must be to truth. And no matter how much you firmly believe this about this diet or that about cigarettes or that about masks, whatever it is, truth first, unequivocal commitment, whether you like the result or not. That's, I think we need to do on our end. For the editor's end, I think we need to first get editors to accept that it is their responsibility to correct errors. Second, we need to get them to recognize the demarcation problem. And then third, we need to get them help finding the resources to wrangle with the demarcation problem, because right now they can't do it. Thank you. Great. Wally, any thoughts on those two questions? See, I think I'm unmuted now. I, I think that uh, both individuals have really hit on um, uh, some important things. One, control your bias. I think that is very, very important for reviewers uh, not to let their bias interfere with their review. And I think in the end, we're all looking for the truth as reflected by the data. And that takes me back to Linus Pauling. I don't think that he fabricated anything. I think he built on the data that he had. Did it turn out to be wrong? Yes, but that's going to happen in science. If we don't continue looking for new avenues of research, uh, we're not going to get anywhere. And so we're going to have these kinds of issues. Uh, I would plead for people that review to if you make a commitment to follow through on it and to do it the best you can possibly do it. From the standpoint of editors, uh, being involved with small journals uh, that have relatively small uh, budgets, uh, most of the work falls directly on the editor. Uh, in many cases, uh, when there are questions as to whether a paper should be uh, rejected or it's got some major efforts. I just have to sit down and and reread that paper uh, and make a decision as to whether it's going to be uh, continued in the review process or we're going to reject it. Thank you so much. These are great. There have been a couple of questions we won't have time to answer, but maybe we can get to uh, afterward. One is. Uh, should statisticians be reviewing papers as one of the reviewers? 
I think most of us feel yes. Uh, should reviewers be paid? That's an interesting one. But the last one, um, there are two others. One was um, asking about papers that were negative or null results, how to get those published. And finally, a statement by one of uh, the questioners is that uh, this questioner doesn't re agree that the primary goal is for truth, rather it's for the pursuit of knowledge. And when we fall into the truth trap, we start believing we are truth sayers. That's an interesting uh, way to end the seminar, I think. Let, let me just briefly comment. Negative data, in my opinion, can be important. And at least the journals I'm involved with, we do accept negative data. Yeah, I would add that I don't see that there's, um, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Hayes talked about the proliferation of journals and how it can have negative consequences. But one of the positive consequences is you can always find an outlet to publish any technically correct paper. So if your paper has negative findings, but is technically correct, you will find a journal that will publish that paper. So um, I, I don't see that that's a barrier any longer. Wonderful. I can't thank you all enough for a wonderfully stimulating session. And uh, let's do it again. <laughs> thank and you so much. I think we're ready thank to you for doing this. We'll give you one minute back. <laughs> Take care.